So I'm actually going to be talking about a specific use case today. Uh, and it's part of the Watson for Natural Resources program at IBM. So it's basically a consortium model. Um, we, we asked our clients for less money when it came to our consulting services. So we would be able to build products that we could resell to other smaller oil and gas clients in Calgary. And kind of across Canada as well, because we work with a lot of mining clients too. And so, tried to be a little bit clever. I came up with four different names for this presentation. And if you can't read them, it's from oil pipelines to data pipelines, from curl to neural, from drill bits to bytes, or from fracking to hacking. And I say that because I have witnessed a monumental shift in Calgary these past couple of years. I used to work at TransCanada uh, as a project engineer where I would print out every engineering drawing. I'd get each one of them printed. We would give them to someone who marks up drawings for a living. They would do it on paper. They would hand it back. We would scan them. We would update the version in FileNet, and that was what our data management process was. And so now today we're talking with a lot of clients about using AR and VR to be able to do automated walkthroughs of facilities so you no longer even have to do any as building. It's done automatically. And so this is what I've seen in Calgary and it's an exciting place to be. We've gone from zero people, zero data scientists a couple years ago, three years ago, uh, in our Calgary office to about 80 that are now on projects. And I think other consulting firms have seen the same thing and that excludes all the companies that also do their own in-house data science as well. I know that Incan is a big, uh, has tried to really in-house a lot of their data science as well. And Chevrons and Exxons have too. So, uh, what I'm gonna talk about today. So a little bit of context for oil and gas. I'm gonna talk briefly about the Watson for Natural Resources program, and then I'm gonna go into a deep dive on something that I specifically built, which was uh, predicting power prices in Alberta to allow companies to dynamically uh, move around when they're using their assets and when they're not, uh, based on a plant's economics. So, number one, uh, who, who here remembers the good old days? $140 a barrel for oil and tequila that ran freely during Stampede Week. Few, few hands, that's great. Uh, I remember those too, and things have changed a little bit, no doubt. And so, ju just to talk about that a little bit, uh, when the times were good, costs associated with a single barrel of production actually almost doubled. It was about uh, cost to extract increased by about 90% globally between 2009 and 2012. And that's, so that's globally, and it was actually far worse in, for Canadian energy companies. It was about three times that, or even four times that, depending on which companies you were looking at. And so with lower oil prices, companies have kind of been forced to get smart and start applying some really cool cutting edge technologies to be able to take out some of these costs. And so now you might see on the right where this is a McKinsey thing, uh, where operating costs went and how companies cut them. Some of them, like eliminated demand, aren't sustainable. Um, <laughs> you're either gonna produce or you're not. If you're going to produce, you can't eliminate demand for having to produce. But when we talk about uh, being able to reduce costs by 20 to 25% for specification or operational changes, that's what we're talking about. So changing how companies work uh, and reworking their entire processes based on machine learning and machine learning models that we can build for them and also the automation piece associated with that. So, thus bringing us to the Watson for Natural Resources program. So this is, these are some of the cool projects we actually do right in Calgary and we've got our rock stars here tonight who are who touch each of these projects. I know that coal was a really big part of gold drill target prediction and exploration geology. 
is predicting how, uh, how gold veins would form using 100 years of data from Gold Corp's Red Lake Mine. And if you think that a geologist can look through 100 years of data and make a good decision, I've got another story for you. Um, in addition to that, we've also partnered with Suncor for a big automation piece. They manage a huge facility, of course, that's $20 billion, and a person can't look at all that data and make good decisions from them. And they actually had a month and a half long uh, plant upset last year that's very close to those, uh, very close to that reason. And we've got people like Tian uh, on that project here too. And then we've also got smaller projects and one that I'm gonna talk about is with Plains Midstream when it comes to power price prediction. Um, we're also working with Husky on how they manage their wells. And we're also working with some uh, doing some work with regards to steam to oil ratio optimization as well. And so the team that we've got here tonight, and we've got uh, a couple people up in the top left corner and a bunch in the bottom right as well, and they can actually tell you in depth on everything we're doing because they're the ones, the boots on the ground, actually doing a lot of this work. We're, we're actually called a liberalized power market. Um, this, this was a trend back in the 90s when we moved away from uh, single government entities producing a bunch of power and just selling it to everyone to a essentially a transmission network that provides a market on which people can buy and sell power. And so since then, Alberta is a good example of a liberalized power market, but so is Ontario, and so is Texas, and also Australia and a lot of places in Europe. So you've got generators who sell power, you've got power traders in the middle typically, and then you've also got the consumers. And so specific to Alberta, power prices actually range from zero dollars a megawatt hour or zero cents per kilowatt hour. So power's free at some times, all the way up to a thousand dollars per megawatt hour. And these prices spike kind of 20 to 50 times. And so when I try and talk to people about what power management's all about, I'll drive my car every day for a buck 25 a liter, but if price, gas prices were to spike 50 times to $75 per liter, I'm pretty sure I'm gonna start walking to work each day, or at least trying the bus. So that's kind of the scale that a lot of plant operators don't understand that they work at, and they make money because they stay on the right side of the economics on average, but uh, there are certainly times where prices spike where they're actually losing money by actually running their equipment to produce something. There's also other interesting parts of the Alberta power market called coincident peak. So you essentially have uh, the peak demand in Alberta is reached at during a 15 minute window in a single month and it can reset because it's uh, people might consume the most power one day and then they might consume even more the next day. But so that peak demand time for transmission connected customers actually incurs a $10,133 charge for every megawatt hour um, they consume. And so in the case of planes, they have a 12 megawatt facility so um, that they're running on average. So that's $120,000 a month that they're spending during that peak time in a 15 minute window or about $1.4 million per year. So if you can predict that and tell a plant operator to take that equipment offline, you can save them a bunch of money really easily and really quickly. And without a huge uh, upset to their production as well. Especially in the case of something like a straddle plant where they're simply extracting liquids off of a pipeline and they can choose whether or not to produce. And the other big thing in Alberta is that we're actually shutting down 47% of our power production in the next 11 years. So that's our entire coal fleet and we're moving to new sources that uh, this very ancient system doesn't understand all that well. Uh, green power, when it's added to, so windmills and solar, when they were added to Europe, um, they actually started adding in negative pricing events. So in 2018, 
there were 200 negative pricing events in Europe. And what that meant is that you had a windmill that you were hoping would be an asset, but you would actually pay someone three cents a kilowatt hour to use your power because there's so much uh, generation on the market at the time. So if I were a consumer, I'd really want to use as much power as I possibly can during those times uh, because I'm getting paid to consume, and that's awesome. It's like Ebates for power. Uh, so what did I build, and what did we build? Uh, so we essentially built a few predictive models. One's a long-term predictive model that makes a forecast on what prices will be within 30 days. We do a shorter term 48 hour prediction as well, uh, where we're able to predict price spikes a lot better. But when it comes to optimizing for when you're taking equipment on and offline, uh, plant operators kind of like that 30 day window. In addition, we also have started building a predictive model for predicting peak demand as well. So our clients would be able to capture those savings as well. And in addition to that, I'm gonna be showing this, the actual tool in a few minutes, but uh, there's also some efficiency and process optimization work that went in on the side just on um, what our clients thought were very bulletproof uh, processes that are 35 years old and there's been so many changes that have been made to this plant that the original optimization work that was done by a process engineer really doesn't apply anymore. And so by e you can do a nice little regression and eke out an extra five to 7%. And for, for a single plant that's making a half billion dollars a year, that five to 7% pays for a few da data scientists really quickly. So there's just some numbers here. Uh, on average, we can, by dynamically moving around work orders, we can kind of save 49% of the associated costs with oper not operating that equipment. So pretty significant cost savings if you're talking at the scale of a plant. Um, by taking a performance hit, by saying that you're not gonna produce as much, you can also cut out spikes as well and not pay for those huge pricing events that end up happening as well. And so just talking a little bit more about the long-term forecasting. The actual model that was built, I can't get into too many specifics, um, just due to intellectual property stuff, but it is an additive regressor. And how we do that regression, um, can't talk about too much, but we do break it down into basically five different time periods where we look at the, we do a couple Fourier analyses based on periodicity of the power market. So within a day, you'll see that it's basically a perfect cycle and I'll show a slide in a second. And then we also do some work with dummy variables on uh, predicting. So Saturdays and Sundays, prices are typically a lot cheaper. So we add all these up to build a single time series forecast that we use for predicting when the best time to be running your equipment is. And then we also extract a much larger trend as well, which uh, our clients seem to like uh, because it gives them an opportunity to look at what hedges would be, uh, what a good hedge would be. So we do, we perform a logistic growth curve there. So what does the Alberta power market look like? So terrible, this looks terrible on this, but uh, if I were to point on here, you've got a price of dollars per megawatt hour. This is 10, this is 60, 70, and 80, and then you've got all the years here, uh, 2018, 17, 16, 15. So uh, when oil prices in Alberta crashed, there were a lot of orphan wells and a lot uh, less demand for power as well. And that was actually reflected in power prices over that time. Uh, of course, an average doesn't tell you the whole story on what's happening, because there are price spikes that play into that as well. But what we've seen is a really big bounce back. So um, the big companies that spend something like 
uh, 100 million to 500 million dollars a year on power. If they were doing that last in 2017, they're probably spending about twice as much in 2018. And I don't see this trend changing based on the uh, based on the fact that we're going to be shutting down even more coal-fired generation as well, which is of course the cheapest power we could produce. And then you have the companies that are also going to be adding this green power, um, and they're going to have to accelerate the depreciation of their other assets more quickly, which will also lead to higher prices as well. So I think this is something that matters. This is actually what the last uh, 10 years of power prices look like in Alberta. And so in this case, uh, we do a little bit of anomaly correction. That when a power plant trips, typically prices spike 20 to 50 times, as I said before. So uh, when we're putting a long-term forecast together, we can't predict those black swan events. That's impossible. Even with, uh, maybe if we had access to someone like Transalta's, all their plant information, we might be able to predict something like that. But uh, the data sets that we're using, we're not able to predict that. We can do that in the short term, but not the long term. Uh, so whether or not they're online or offline it is, but I'm, I'm talking about more from a maintenance perspective on what actually causes the trip. So we do, so in the short term, we do use the ASO data set in being able to predict if prices are going to spike, but I can't tell you if prices are going to spike in three weeks from now. Yeah. So uh, the blue line are the actual prices, and you can see that prices saturate fairly often. It's a fairly, these are fairly sharp peaks at $1,000 per megawatt hour, and we do some anomaly smoothing to remove those. Um, this is what the long-term forecast actually showed. So uh, this is a 30-day prediction. So we're actually looking 30 days out. A lot of these spikes were actually, that you see here, and uh, the zero pricing event that you see, were actually added in in the short term for forecast. So we add the two together to build a final model. Uh, but as you can see here, we actually did perform pretty well. Um, and going back uh, to this regressor model, we can see the competing performances. So we actually tried a bunch of models. Uh, this additive regressor actually performed the best. Uh, we struggled with ARIMA just because there aren't enough orders, um, not enough vari variables essentially for uh, predicting such sharp peaks when it comes to power prices. It moves a lot more than what an ARIMA is typically used for in forecasting. Um, the, and we do perform about 51% better than a naive Bayes model. Uh, that's kind of the benchmark I would typically use in doing some of this time series forecasting. Um, I usually compare naive Bayes against an analyst with a really good, uh, really good Excel knowledge. Uh, so if we can beat that, we're doing pretty well. And then uh, what's surprising is that when we did add in a neural network, and specifically the LSTM, uh, even this model outperformed that. So I'm not fully convinced of that, of course. Um, it's just based on time and the amount of work we had to do. It's likely that we'd be able to point, but this was the current state. And we did this in about four months and built the final product that I'll show you. So uh, when it comes to a shorter term price spike prediction, if I were to just highlight some of these numbers, on the top is how much a price spike contributes to a company's invoice for power for their power bill, and the bottom, blue, is actually the amount of time that was spent uh, full in a price spike situation. So as you can see in 2018, price spikes made up about two and a quarter percent of all the time throughout a year, but they made up 29 and a half percent of a company's invoices. So it's a pretty meaty problem to go after. And so this is what our short-term forecasting tool does as well. And the short-term forecast actually just comes in as a Twilio text alert. Uh, don't even need a front end or GUI for it. So the solution architecture. What we do is we use a React front end with a Flask back end. And 
we uh, build for any data scientist we have on a project. We essentially treat it as a microservice, everything we do as microservices. So uh, we've got kind of a spec to build for a front end and then for each of the Flask apps, we essentially just build its own, put it in a Docker, uh, Docker container with uh, Kuber Kubernetes uh, orchestration on the cloud and what we end up doing is we just build each piece individually and so everyone can work in parallel to actually build something fairly quickly. So you're not constantly waiting on dependencies from everyone else uh, when it comes to orchestrating one of these projects. Specifically, we're pulling in a lot of weather data across not only Alberta, but also BC, Saskatchewan, and Montana because we buy and sell a lot of power between all those jurisdictions as well. Uh, there's, and then we also pull in all the ASO data as well, which is if, I don't think I said this before, but ASO is the Alberta Electric System Operator. Uh, so they've got a really rich data set on which they provide all the market data for how uh, power prices and power plants are actually performing uh, every hour. Uh, we do. Now, I, so in this case, this could be a plug for IBM because we did buy the weather company uh, last year. I think, so when it comes to actually modeling weather, I would say that the weather company likely does the best. So there was some, uh, before when Maria was talking about Summit and what was the other one? Sierra. Sierra. So they actually do a lot of weather simulations on that as well. Uh, but we actually have the smallest resolution for predicting weather globally. So we can uh, predict weather on a four by four mi square mile grid. And we do that for the entire, uh, for all the geographies. Uh, we also have the most data sources. It's all built on Apache Kafka as well. Uh, so basically, the exact same architecture that Netflix uses for giving you movies, we use for processing uh, weather data globally. And there's even interest in being able to pull in specific cell phone data in the future to add to that data set. Yeah, so I'm, I'm not a meteorologist, but uh, I do use the data. And uh, when it comes to also breadth as well, the fact of the matter is, is that the the weather company, I don't have to go anywhere else when it comes to getting weather data. Uh, everything globally I can just get from a single source as opposed to having to deal with the Canadian, uh, whether it's Nav Canada or whoever, for getting specific meteorological data sets for specific geographies. Uh, so to summarize this quickly, we've got a bunch of data and then we build a bunch of things on top of it. Some of those things interact. Uh, we try and give some insights into how uh, plant operators consume power, how their power bill correlates with that, um, just in natural language. And then we also give them a couple tools for being able to optimize work schedules as well and automate all that. So I'm gonna take, so if you wanna add me on LinkedIn, you can go Add me on linkedin.com slash in slash Seamaster. I got Seamaster. Um, I thought it would have been taken, but that's pretty cool. So feel free to add me. And then if you want to uh, talk about jobs, I'll just make sure to forward you to Cole and give him all the work to do. So I'm just going to end my slide deck there and then actually show you what we built briefly, let you know that it's real. Here's a long-term forecast. Um, doesn't look super good on the low DPI projector, but as you can see, uh, so this is seven days back and seven days forward in which we're making a prediction. And then what we do on top of this, and we automate all of this as well, but just uh, for the purposes of this group, we also, so, I can actually go and search for any piece of equipment and I'm gonna go with the compressor since I already filled that out. This is a big 15,000 horsepower compressor. I can pick shutdown and start times and restart times. 
and then decide when I want to take that piece of equipment offline because I want to do it when prices are most expensive. So if I do that, it shouldn't move. Perfect. So this single work order where you've got to shut down this one piece of equipment, um, if you were to pick the poor time, it would be about $3,000 worth of savings. But you can actually save an extra $5,200 on top of that simply by moving your work order a little bit later in the week. And then also to a later time as well when you hit peak periods. And then just briefly, you can also dive into your invoices and look at how you've performed historically from a plant perspective. Uh, so if I were to pick January to October. So prices did saturate during that time. Uh, that's not wrong. And then it'll also tell you when the highest price was and what the average prices were. And then just some information on how much you're actually spending. We also do some work around power factor. Um, I'm not gonna get into that because I think that's explaining power factors probably beyond the scope of this. But I think that's about 30 minutes, so I'm going to wrap it up here. And uh, thank you all for coming out tonight. And if you have any questions, let me know.